Hello and welcome to Coffee Pot Conversations, hosted by... Oh dear. Let's start that one again. Hello and welcome to Coffee Pot Conversations, hosted by an Englishman in Paris. Today's episode is one of those weird ones that I'd pre-recorded, again back in uh, August time I believe it was. And since then, bits have changed, bits have uh, taken place. The quality of the recording is different, so apologies for that. It's probably going to be a little bit different again today. Um, I'm just trying a few different bits and pieces, which will be covered in a later episode, which will also then be discussed at another later episode. Anyway, um, today's episode 1.6, Casablanca, sees me talking about the film Casablanca uh, and going a bit bit extra beyond that, as is my want, as I tend to do. But what's happened in the world recently, um, aside from being hinted at, told, told off um it's all constructive criticism and and i appreciate the feedback i really really do it's just the way that i'm doing things at the moment again very organic show is is growing naturally in different ways so my my part for today um yes each part before the major episode is the main part of the episode is almost like uh a podcast episode in itself. For that, I apologise. I can see we're nearly hitting the, the two-minute mark already and that all I've been doing is just going over old ground uh, and not covering anything new. So, the new stuff. Putin's been re-elected in Russia. I'm not here for that political uh, conversation, as we're aware. Um, if you want to get in touch with me about it, that's not a problem at all. I got told 85% of people voted for him to to be put back in, or to, to remain in power. But I haven't been told the f- actual figures and we know everything that takes place around all of that. So we're, we're going to cut that one short. The next thing is Kate Middleton, the, uh, the new Princess of Wales, uh, or the current Princess of Wales. She did some strange Photoshop stuff, which she's been berated for. The backstory is she's been in hospital, she's come out, she's not going to be doing duties for however many weeks it is she won't be back out before easter so she sent a mother's day photo i think it was to the newspapers and they've gone oh yeah great and the people gone actually look here look there the photo isn't real it's it's not as perceived as as it should be and they they've essentially pulled it apart really poor photoshopping kind of thing but the, the royal family won't issue the original photo and they won't explain what's going on. So a few days afterwards, just to try and allay all the, the fears and conspiracy theories, there's a video being put out of uh, William and Kate walking around Windsor, the, a farm shop. People are saying it's not even Kate. Now, I don't know. I've not seen the video. I've seen a close-up pixelated photo of a screenshot of the video. I don't know. And you know what? The Royal Family should just come out and go, this is the situation, this is what's happened. If it's good, if it's bad, it doesn't matter, at least we know where we're at. They're the main issues uh, covering the real world, the the bigger picture, but there's something else that's taken place that I want to to cover. It's a very delicate subject matter. Um, So apologies for any offence caused. I know people are waiting for a punchline here, but it, it isn't that. What's happened uh, in the world of cinema is Mary Poppins has been given a new classification. It used to be a youth universal. It's now PG for uh, parental guidance. So, you know, you can still take your children to watch it or hire it in, whatever it is. And as long as the parents are aware, that's fine. That's not a problem. But the thing that's caused this is a clip where um, the chimney sweeps are on top of the roofs and Admiral Boom, who's, you know, an, an old Navy officer, he sees them coming towards him and he uses a word which has got racial connotations. Now, I'm going to use the word in the context uh, of the, the podcast and... Obviously, I don't wish to cause offence to anybody um, for for me using the word. That word is Hottentot. Now, these uh, the word 
Hottentot um, be, it became a standard identifier for the people living in Southwest Africa um, from sort of the, the 16th century onwards up to a kind of um, mid 19th century. It was to do with um, the Dutch who first encountered the San people and the Kwekwe people. Hottentots was their word for stutterers um, and it's believed that they got that name through the, the language uh, of Kwesan, which is obviously a mixture of the Kwekwe and the San people, uh, where they used the clicks to denote uh, consonants. Um, and it's something that Europeans weren't familiar with. So as a result, the, the people and the land became became known as this. Now, I'd never heard the term before a few weeks back, but not as a result of, of the Mary Poppins uh, reclassification. I spoke to Monk about it uh, actually today and we were on the way back from the shops and I explained to him what I'm doing for this podcast and so okay. And then I explained that I'm going to be covering this side of things and he had no idea that it's gone from a U to a PG and he had no idea that the word had been used and he had no idea of the word at all. Now, my uncle, bless him, he's not a, a young lad, but he was he was f- totally unaware. Now, he's, he's heard over the years many, many racial slurs um, towards many, many different peoples. Uh, he's involved even at, at, at his ripe age uh, in... Uh, discriminatory things and inequality and inclusion. So he's 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 fairly clued up with it. But this was a word that he hadn't heard. Now there are there are a few different routes that this conversation can take, but I'm I'm not going to go in depth on too many of them. For me, I like I say, I hadn't heard the word prior to actually reading it, and I'd read it in a book called Mummified by Angela Stien. And apologies for the pronunciation of your surname if it isn't correct published by Manchester Press and it's about the ethical movement and distribution and display of mummified objects uh, or people it it depends on how you look at things as to your own interpretation and then the book delves into the whole movement generally focusing around the British and the French the Louvre and the British Museum and a few others in between. Now, one thing that did pop up was the hot and top Venus. And we know what I'm like. I get a, a bee in my bonnet and I need to know the ins and outs of everything. So I did a little bit of digging um, around this because I'd never heard of it. And it's to do with a lady called Sarah Bartman. Um, Sarah's the anglicised version of, of her actual name. So her actual name is Sachi Bartman, uh, and she was an African woman, and in the early 1800s became, she was saying, an international sensation. It was essentially objectification. She was taken from her home in Africa and claimed that there was a contract signed despite her not being able to read or write. Uh, and she was brought back to England and then um, given a stage name, the Hottentot Venus, and paraded around uh, freak shows and, and sort of the, the, almost like the greatest showman, that type of thing, but, but not quite as glamorously Hollywood. The reason she was brought back is because she had a condition called stetopedia, which may well have resulted in her um, protruding buttocks. At the time, it was an an oddity. Um, Obviously, uh, white Europeans uh, hadn't seen such things. So she was brought over to England and taken around on these tours around England and Ireland, um, taken to parties, where people were allowed to touch her and dance with her. And it it obviously wasn't a very good time for her. She was apparently earning money, but as you can imagine, it wouldn't have been a great deal. And it's it's leading back again to to this book about where we, we have this human curiosity of what we don't understand, or as well as the unknown. And it's 
it is a difficult situation. We can't remove history. We can't change history. We should learn from history. But whether we're going to pick things up, take things back, replace them from whence we got them in order for them to be shown in their hometown or kept hidden away so no one can see them, it's a very, very difficult situation. The, the story continues that she was taken um, over to Paris, uh, Sarah Bartman, and again, the same sort of thing was taking place, except it was a little bit worse. Um, she was um, transported from England to France, and then she was sold, and she was exhibited um, around Paris and in a cage alongside a baby rhinoceros. Um, not the greatest of, of existences for, for someone. Um, she was treated like an animal, uh, and there is some evidence that suggests that at one point a collar was placed around her neck. Now, we don't know how true this is. I don't know how true this is. I've not done enough research on her. But she died in Paris in 1815, round about the age of 26. Um, scientists preserved parts of her body and they remained in a museum in Paris um, for many, many years um, to support racist theories surrounding those of African ancestry. It's, it falls nicely into the lap of, again, the Western Europeans who, who want supremacy uh, and colonialisation over people, that those that they feel aren't as advanced or civilised as, you know, those who... Well, let's not go into details about those people. So again, we have um, the, the ethical side of things whereby France are holding Sarah Bartman's remains in the same way as the British Museum are holding the... Um, We've got the Elgin marbles and, and the Benin uh, bronzes, which I studied um, during my my bachelor's. Do we repatriate, give things back where finally they get their resting place where they should be, or do we allow such things to to be viewed and and remain in in sight in thoughts of people? So things don't ever happen again it's a very very uh, difficult situation which at some point i suspect i will be covering however going back to sarah, sarah bartman in 1994 um with nelson mandela he asked france to re return the remains and uh, they did in 2002 and they were buried uh, near her birthplace in eastern cape province now, this sort of loosely ties up with the episode in Casablanca because I do take things a little bit wider. I don't mention about um, Napoleon's invasion of Egypt or anything like that at all, but I do say about um, colonisation in different parts of the world, obviously one of them being uh, Africa. So I will now let Rory sing us a jingle. Coffee Park Conversations. Coffee Park Conversations. In this episode, I discuss the film Casablanca, but in a, a wider context than just a film review. I talk about the colonisation of regions by France, and then I go into a slightly uh, darker period of time during the, the Second World War when the film was set. So, sit back, enjoy yourself. It's a uh, Roughly a 20 minute episode that you're going to be listening to, just me talking with the research on my uh, on my screens. Coffee Park Conversations. I went to see a film at a rooftop cinema a few weeks ago. It was half a dozen stops down on the London Underground from where I live on the top floor of a car park. That's the cinema, I was on the top floor of a car park. I don't live on the top floor of a car park. But anyway, there was a big screen and deck chairs, unlimited popcorn and Casablanca, which I had never seen before. Yes, at the age of 47, I was still uninitiated with one of the classics. Should it be a classic? I'm going to say yes. It blew me away and has easily stood the test of time. 
It's not an epic like Cleopatra or Lawrence of Arabia, but it was an old film, obviously, and yes, you could tell. It had a few special effects. Some of the action behind the central characters wasn't computer generated, that's for sure. But for the time of its filming, it certainly was good enough. The sets were typical of the old film style. However, the script was amazing. As a graduate with a master's in creative writing and a mind of magnificent wit, one-liners and cutting remarks, I was certainly very pleased with what I heard. You hear certain things over the years relating to the film in terms of catchphrases, and I waited to hear them. You, you know they're coming, but you just don't know when, unless you've seen the film before. But at this viewing, you couldn't hear people say them anyway, uh, as we all had earphones on, like a silent disco. So some catchphrases happen as you'd expect, and some happen slightly off what we've heard over the years, and it's fine. I didn't know the film, only the, the key phrases. And I knew it was set back in the Second World War, but I didn't realise it was filmed in the Second World War. And that's one reason why it wasn't filmed on location. It got me thinking how real it was at the time, how realistic was the story as to what was happening. And one thing I've learned is I need to do a lot of research. Not just for these types of episodes, but for a lot of things in general. My history knowledge, and it's not just my history education, but, but when you go to school in certain countries, you are taught a certain amount of history about certain things. Uh, it, it's primarily to get you through the tests and the exams. Maybe a peak in interest and it enable people going to history uh, courses at university or to work out their own direction for their own future. But when I was at school, my, my history was pretty much just about the Marie Celeste, the Industrial Revolution and the Second World War. I think that was probably about all I've taken away from my history lessons at school. Everything else I've learned as I've gone through life, just listening to conversations, picking out little bits and pieces. Historical facts, yeah, you know, I suppose I did cover the Romans as well, that sort of thing. I couldn't really tell you the difference between the Roman gods and the Greek gods, though. I, I only know which gods are the Norse ones because they sound different, and that's sort of it. But then, is that history or actually religion? That could well be a different topic for a different podcast. Anyway, I did some digging around whilst falling down a rabbit hole and what I found was a chap called Jacques Cartier, which is a beautiful French name. Uh, he was the first European to make his way and to navigate through the Saint Laurent River, which is at the top part of the American-Canadian northeast coast, one of the, the major indents. That was back around the early to mid-1500s, 1534. He went on a couple of expeditions, finishing in 1542, and it laid the basis for the French to claim parts of North America under the instruction of King Francis I. This is why that region started to become colonised with the French language. That said, he originally named Canada, Canata, meaning a village or a settlement, and it comes from the local language, Huron Iroquois, that was already being spoken there by the natives. So uh, Jacques Cartier visited Montreal and started to make his way down the river, picking up all the little towns on his way. And yeah, from there they stole the gold, silver, copper and spices, which then opened up a little bit of a trade route for them. In 1692, René Robert Cavalier, the Sieur de la Salle, born in Rouen in northern France on the Seine, was the first European to travel down the Mississippi River. On his travels, he claimed the territory for France under King Louis XIV, the sun god. So, under King Louis, he named the place Louisiana. And there are a few different bits popping up in future podcasts about the sun god, so I'll be covering him at later dates. So, back to the episode. <clears throat> and in 1692, René Robert Cavalier has sailed down the Mississippi and founded Louisiana. However... In, nine, uh, sorry, in 1758, as part of the Global Seven Year War, the British, already settled in New England, mounted attacks on New France uh, by land and by sea. And in September of 1759, the British General James Wolfe defeated the French in Quebec. By the autumn of 1760, Montreal fell under British rule. After the Treaty of Paris in 1763, France gave up the remainder of her colonised regions on the American mainland. The majority of these went to Great Britain, whilst the west bank of the Mississippi went to Spain, who already held areas such as Florida and the Gulf of Mexico. This was the end of New France, with over 20,000 citizens across a time frame of 250 years. However, there's more to French colonisation than just this. What I didn't know was the extent to which France had explored and colonised different areas of the world. 
But I also didn't realise that the first non-Europeans to explore settlements in America were the Norse, specifically the Vikings from Scandinavia. It was around the year 1000 AD when Leif Erikson, a Norse explorer, is believed to have established a short-lived settlement in present-day Newfoundland in Canada. The area known as Vinland, meaning Wineland, was a generic name given to the lands that they explored. Allegedly first set foot on by Leif Erikson, son of Eric the Red, who founded the first North settlement of Greenland, the area wasn't uninhabited and contact with the natives, being the first known instance of meeting people from the other side of the globe, wasn't smooth. The distance between Finland and Greenland probably led the Norse to conclude that these riches weren't quite the worthwhile journeys. They have discovered a Viking site known as Lance or Meadows. Uh, they discovered that in the 1960s uh, at the Gulf of St Lawrence. More Details can be found in the 13th century sagas, the Saga of the Greenlanders. Uh, I'm not going to attempt to pronounce that in Icelandic. As well as uh, in Eric the Red Saga, which again I'm definitely not going to try and pronounce. But what I do remember from my childhood days at, at primary school or, or juniors is that I used to read a big hardback book uh, in size, not in number of pages. It's probably only about 100, 120 pages, I guess. It was the saga of Eric the Viking, and I absolutely adored that book. I wasn't allowed to keep it because it belonged to the school, um, but, you know, I'm going to hunt that one down, just my own personal library. When I say library, I mean my Billy bookcases from Ikea. I honestly don't have a library. I've got one, two, three bookcases in my bedroom. Not full up with books, but I suppose they could all fit on one bookcase uh, if I stored them properly. But I've also got my university notes taken up the entire shelf and my university textbooks and reading materials taken up uh, another shelf each as well. The more significant and sustained colonisation of America now began with Christopher Columbus's famous voyages. In 1492, Columbus, the Italian explorer, but sailing underneath the Spanish flag, uh, opened a, a way for further European exploration and colonisation of the Americas over the next few hundred years, namely for the main European powers being Spain, Portugal, Britain, France and the Netherlands. A personal note of interest for me was the rumour that Christopher Columbus was born in Ibiza. It's difficult to know who is right and who isn't, but generally they believe that his son Ferdinand Columbus did live in Ibiza, in Ibiza town, uh, from 1523 until his death in 1539. His house, known as the Casa de Colón, House of Columbus, uh, still stands today in the old town and it's become a historical site and museum uh, for people to look at the, the connection between Columbus and Ibiza through his son. And now the historical facts about French colonisation around Africa that linked us back to Casablanca in Morocco. So in uh, 1638, a French trading post was built on the Senegal River. A couple hundred years later, in 1827, the Turkish governor of Algiers in Algeria provokes a French consul and a blockade is put in place. In 1830, a French invasion starts in Algeria and this brings the region under the control of the French Empire. The invasion actually came from a military plan uh, originally devised by Napoleon in 1808 during his empirical rule. The control of Algeria was deemed a geographical necessity to reduce the possibility of any tax on France from the south. In 1839, Abdel Kader proclaims a holy war against the French in Algeria, and that lasts for eight years. In 1869, Britain, France and Italy take joint control of Tunisian finances after the country falls into bankruptcy. Later on in 1881, France invades Tunisia from Algeria and the Treaty of Bardo forces a Bay of Tunis to accept the state as French protectorate. France and Britain agreed colonial boundaries for Senegal and Gambia uh, in West Africa in 1889 and then in 1893 uh, the French claimed the Ivory Coast as a French colony and Côte d'Ivoire. 1905 Kaiser Wilhelm II, who was the last German emperor, visits Tangiers in Morocco to support the country's independence. However, this causes diplomatic crisis uh, with French and British colonial powers. A year later, 1906, at the Algeciras Conference in Spain, both Spain and France were entrusted with policing Morocco as per Austria's suggestion, going against Germany's ideas for the country. 
1912 saw the Treaty of Fez establishing a French protectorate in Morocco. France and Spain agreeing uh, that the, the divided ruling France would take the south and Spain the minimal amount of the north. In 1955, an armed uprising in Morocco persuades France for the acceptance of the principle of independence for the colony. And in uh, 1956, Morocco is totally independent. In 1959, more than one million French, Italian and Spanish nationals were settled in Algeria. Again, this will all no doubt end to another podcast episode. So during the 1960s, many more African countries gained independence from uh, French colonisation. And that then leads on to one part of the film Casablanca that, that was highlighted for me, uh, was a term used by some of the characters, Vichy France. I actually had no idea what that was all about. So when I came uh, back to, to researching for the, uh, this podcast episode, I delved a little deeper, and it was quite fascinating uh, what I not only discovered, but just what I didn't know that I didn't know. Now, I don't want to delve too much into this, as it's quite a dark period of time. Essentially, during the Second World War, when France was invaded and subsequently occupied, Vichy France was a collaborationist regime based in the town of Vichy. With France's defeat in June 1940, Marshal Philippe Pétain, uh, a revered World War I hero, was appointed as the head of the French government. The Vichy regime officially established its capital in Vichy to avoid the direct control of the German-occupied zone in the north. Now, the demarcation line installed cut through regions throughout southwest and central France. Uh, they weren't like strict boundaries. It, it sort of wasn't the, the edge. Um, there, there were some zones that were uh, uh, deemed as a free zone, some were occupied. It's like if you look at, say, the first arrondissement, uh, not only is there a splicing through Rue de Rivoli, but also if you were to take that same uh, lines through, say, Forum de la there's just no rhyme or reason. Uh, one moment you're free, the next you're not, and there's border patrols taking care of things. You've, you've got no choice. You are where you are, and that couldn't have been easy for people. On top of that, the Vichy regime collaborated with Nazi Germany. Philip Pétain and his government believed that cooperating with the Germans would ensure better treatment for the French people and preserve some form of sovereignty. However, in reality, Vichy France became a puppet state under German influence. The regime implemented anti-Semitic policies as a result of this, targeting Jews living in France. Jewish citizens uh, faced discrimination, persecution and deportations at concentration camps. The infamous Vichy government passed laws, facilitated the round-up and deportation of thousands of Jews during the Holocaust. And this is in the Vichy side of France, let alone what took place in occupied France. One of the more, uh, I don't want to say popular, but one of the more well-known memorials is in the Marais, in Rue des Hospitalières saint gervais The uh, two plaques on the facade of École des de Hospitalières saint gervais uh, act as a reminder of the 165 Jewish school children that went to the concentration camps and, and never came back. General Charles de Gaulle, uh, the prominent military leader, rejected the armistice with Germany and fled to London. From there, he led the Free French Forces, which was a group of exiled French soldiers and resistance fighters who opposed the Vichy France collaboration and fought alongside the Allies. As the war progressed and the tide turned against the Axis powers, uh, that's the three principal partners being Germany, Italy and Japan, led by uh, Adolf Hitler, Italian dictator Benito Mussolini and Japanese Emperor Hirohito. Um, the Axis powers also consisted of Albania, Bulgaria, Finland, Hungary, Romania and Thailand. So uh, as the uh, tide turned against them, the influence of the Vichy regime dwindled and the Allied forces, including the Free French forces, liberated France from Nazi occupation in 1944. The Vichy government was disbanded and many of its leaders were tried and sentenced for collaboration after the war. Vichy France remains a contentious part of French history. Some argue that the regime merely sought to maintain a semblance of order and protect French interests amid the devastation of war. Others say it's a shameful collaboration with a brutal occupying force and it is uh, subject of historical analysis and debate not only in France but beyond. It is still a complex and sensitive issue within French history. And knowing this now sheds new light on Casablanca for me, making it seem almost like it was a propaganda feel-good film. 
that I'm not going to spoil it, but the situation that was taking place in Casablanca around the French Nazi collaboration, it all sort of seems to time with what the Americans were trying to do at the time. Uh, the film actually comes from a play called Everybody Comes to Rick's. It was uh, actually a play meant for Broadway, but uh, Warner Brothers took it, manipulated it a little bit and made it into the film that we all know and now love. Originally going to be set in Lisbon, it changed location uh, partly because it's slightly more exotic and also because of real-life world events. The film was due to be released in early 1943, but it actually premiered on November 26th in 1942 to coincide with the Allied invasion of North Africa and the capture of Casablanca. It then went into wide release in uh, 1943 in January, January 23rd, to coincide with the Casablanca conference, which was a high-level meeting between Churchill and Franklin D. Roosevelt in Casablanca. A lot of the smaller roles played by actors uh, had first-hand experiences of the war. Um, the waiter, Karl, was a Jewish-Hungarian who fled Germany in, uh, in 1939, and he actually lost three sisters in a concentration camp. The roulette players spent time in a concentration camp. Uh, fortunately, he was freed. And there's a pickpocket in the film who was a German-Jewish actor and refugee. And uh, the German film star Conrad Wright, who plays Major Henry Strasser, even though he fled the Nazis, was actually often cast as a Nazi in American films. The main characters, Rick and Ilsa, originally called Lois, but altered to match Ingrid Bergman's Norse roots, have a relationship uh, in Paris before they decide to leave as the Germans invade. Uh, because of the war, all the filming took place in California. However, without the war, there would be no film, and with no film, this podcast episode wouldn't exist. So, bringing this all back to a nice Sunday afternoon, with the sun slowly sweeping across the sky, I can now look at my girlfriend, and with seven trips under our belt so far, I can categorically tell her that we'll always have Paris, as well as the unlimited popcorn on the car park roof in East London. Coffee Park Conversations. Thank you for joining us today on An Englishman Paris Presents Coffee Pot Conversations. I hope you enjoyed the insightful dialogue about Paris, and a fascinating history. Remember, you can read more about my exploits surrounding Paris by visiting my blog at anenglishmaninparis.blog. If you'd like to help the podcast grow, become a part of the community and keep the coffee brewing, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com forward slash anenglishmaninparis. Don't forget to subscribe to Coffee Pot Conversations on your podcast platform. And if you want, leave a decent review for me. I'm not sure if I'll find it, but it'll be there for others to see. However, if you have any thoughts, suggestions, or if you'd like to be a guest on the show, drop an email to coffeepot at an Englishman in Paris dot blog. There's a big chance that I'll include it in the next conclusion. So tune in next time for another intriguing conversation. And until then, au revoir and keep sipping on that rich intellectual brew with Coffee Pot Conversations. Coming up on Coffee Pot Conversations. We actually have some interviews. I did a little digging and, and found someone that's prepared to take a little bit of their time and invest in uh, in the podcast. So hopefully they'll become a, a more regular feature that you'll be listening to over the next few years. A wide scope of, of um, topics that we'll be discussing and discovering, as well as my next episode, which will be about, well, you just need to wait and find out. Coffee Park Conversations. So that was episode 1.6, Casablanca. Please let me know what you thought of it. You can email me, podcast at an Englishman in Paris dot blog. You can uh, find me on Instagram at an Englishman in Paris blog. Or you can find me on many, many different platforms, Spotify, iTunes, well, Apple Podcasts. Um, Alexa, Amazon Podcast, whatever it's called, Podbean. That's my uh, my latest fun episode. Oh, oh dear. Not sure if you can hear that. Now, I believe I've got copyright rights for that because that's my 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 bit. Anyway, I'm going to stop it. Thank you, Nev. Um, so, yeah, I'm on Podbean where I do the occasional live podcast, which I feel more like a call-in radio show. So... 
please, please do feel free to uh, follow me on there as well. Let me know what's going on. I have got a couple of uh, people from Iran that listen to me. And I've been told that I've also got some people from the Philippines that listen, which uh, I don't think that's new. I do need to update my figures because I am keeping the graph because I'm a little bit nerdy like that. And it's always uh, interesting to find out where people come from uh, that, that listen to me globally. So feel free to listen to me, Podbean, or I say one of the other platforms, Spotify is still around. It makes no difference to me. Just make sure that you are listening. You can even listen to at Coffee Pot Conversations podcast on Instagram. Uh, yeah, I can't imagine why anyone would want to have a 45-minute Instagram reel uh, that they're listening to when they can just pick it up on one of the podcast platforms. So if you've got any questions, if you've got any answers, you've got any comments, criticisms, corrections, please, please do let me know. In the meantime, Jasper's Jingle. Coming up on Coffee Pot Conversations. We have that repeat guest. We also have uh, another interview where it's not actually taking place yet, so I need to narrow them down real quick. We've got the best bits coming up. We are that close to the end of the season, end of my first debut season, uh, which for me is quite phenomenal. I know we're 1.6 now, so we've got 1.7, 0.8, 0.9, and then the best bits, and that will be the season over. I'll then be off to Paris for the Olympics. Uh, but we've got one more interview just before the Olympics one, so don't panic. However, we also do have an interview that has taken place. Um, and for that episode, I'm going to do something a little bit different. Now, I'm not going to tell you what it is, uh, but you're going to just have to wait. There, there's no other other way of putting it. So that is still to come. That will be the episode after this one, I believe. No, it won't. I have the return guest next episode. But like anything, it can all change because this wasn't meant to be here. This was recorded, I'll say, back in, in the early part of me not even knowing what I was doing with no direction and now I do know what I'm doing but still with no direction so don't forget follow me on uh, all the, the usual platforms Instagram podcast platforms buymeacoffee.com uh, I'm I'm there I'm around I'm, I'm doing stuff I don't do Twitter I don't do Facebook um, but I do do questions and the question is if you could go back in time without consequence when and where would you go? And if you are on Spotify and you fancy doing the poll, the poll question is, have you seen the film Casablanca? Yes, it was great. Yes, it was meh. No, I don't want to. No, never got round to it. No, but I will now. So, that's it for 1.6 Casablanca. I am Paul, an Englishman in Paris, and this has been... Coffee Park Conversations.